So good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to speak about optimizing star ratings and enhancing uh, RAF scores, the risk-adjusted CMS scores. And our themes tonight are reaching for the stars. Now, I want you to have uh, virtual reality. We were trying to be very cost effective tonight in our decorations. We we're going to save uh, Barry Ellis some dollars, but there's supposed to be, in your minds, these balloons on the table that are reaching to the stars uh, with stars on them. And we were supposed to tonight see some stars out here. I don't think that's going to happen. But we're supposed to make this memorable so you'll remember the stars. Additionally, we were hoping, along the theme of capturing intended dollars for patient care, that there'd be some monopoly money on, on the tables. And I think maybe that's why the bank is really here, is to help us with the dollars. But we're going to be talking about reaching for the stars, the star ratings, and uh, capturing the intended dollars for patient care. And I understand we're going to have some surprises uh, from Dr. Jump uh, as he introduces the HCC's proper coding, et cetera. I guess I go to the next slide. Let's see here. That's blank, so I've got to click it again. So what's in store for us this evening? Hopefully, let's see. We're going to have 45 minutes, 50 minutes uh, of very valuable information, pearls, and tools. Our goal is to assist your practices in optimizing patient care while at the same time capturing intended uh, Medicare dollars. So Yogini Kulkarni Sharma, did I say it right this time? Okay. Uh, she is uh, Sound Path Health's, our plan's uh, director of quality improvement. And she is going to provide an overview of star ratings. Some of you may be very familiar, others may not be. And additionally, and very importantly, she's going to be sharing a very powerful, actionable tool that the health plan will be rolling out uh, in the very near future. We think it's really going to be very valuable uh, in helping address gaps in care, et cetera, and sharing information that we have from claims data with all of you. Then, and I can't resist saying this, let's see here. How's this going to work? Okay, then, this joke must be said all the time, but I've never said it. Dr. Jump is going to jump in um, and address uh, code, how we're going to chart, uh, document well, how we're going to document well in our charts. Uh, and he's going to uh, address coding, uh, risk adjustment enhancement, and it's going to be made easy. We were trying to figure out if we're going to call this uh, uh, documentation and RAF 101 or maybe for dummies, and we decided doctors didn't want to be called dummies. So uh, anyway, but it's going to be simplified. We hope we're making it really easy uh, for all of you to have something that you can take back tomorrow morning to your practices and, and use it and find it helpful. Um, so and then, let's see here. And then we hope that these concepts, pearls, and tools will really be useful to you. Um, and you'll see we've simplified things, but we think by doing things in a simplified manner, it's going to make it easy to use and not be overwhelming. Um, before we turn the mic over to Yogini, who's going to be our first speaker, it's a little different order than on the agenda, uh, I want to thank two people that were really very helpful behind the scenes in helping us achieve uh, tonight's program. And that's our coders. The coder at SoundPath Health, uh, Nicole and Camille, um, who is the coder here for all of you at PSW. Then also, I want to acknowledge uh, our appreciation for uh, other additional folks uh, who enabled tonight's discussion. And I may be missing somebody, so let me know if I am. Uh, but Dr. Jump has put in tremendous effort. Uh, he and I have been working together. He's been educating me um, in trying to come up with something that would really be attractive and helpful to you tonight. And I understand he's also uh, ganged up with Dr. Goen to do some, um, 
some waking us all up tonight, and there's some surprises that will be presented. Uh, Yogini, uh, who will be following me. Uh, Tammy, who uh, from PSW, who has made sure that uh, everything came together uh, this evening. Mariella and Bev. Um, you've recently sent uh, folks to a conference uh, on uh, HCC's RAF risk adjustment, and all the input that they brought back has really informed tonight and helped us launch tonight's program. So with no further ado, Yogini, you want to come and uh, take the mic? And I think I figured this out. You probably know it better than me. But forward pointing that direction will fill up your slides. Yes. You no, know, we just we decided just to leave it right there. Okay. So it's I think it's working. It's working, right? And by the way, at the end we're gonna be available for questions. Um, and if there's a key question that needs to be asked during the talk, don't hesitate to ask. Mm -hmm. Okay? Good. Well, thank you, Dr. Young. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you all about star ratings and how we could collaborate in making it uh, and improving our current star rating. Um, what I'd like to do is to begin with sharing with you some information about star ratings, what, are, what they are, and some basic stuff so that we need to understand uh, why, why do we have star ratings and how do we get to that calculation and, and what's all about. Uh, after which, I'll share with you a couple of tools that you should have all got uh, on your chair, we did place two of these, two documents, and I hope everybody has one of each. If you don't, we could just let us know, we can pass them out again. Um, so that's where we are. Um, so about star ratings. So SoundPath Health's goal is to be the partner of choice. And um, achieving our star ratings will certainly make us the partner of choice. So what are star ratings? Um, star ratings basically are, is a measurement system that CMS uses to assign a certain rating for Medicare Advantage plans. It's a system that, that's used to really judge the relative quality of the healthcare plan. And it's based on clinical pharmacy, the physician, and other administrative measures that the plan uh, is responsible for. It's basically a score, and uh, it ranges from one to five, one being low, and five being the highest. Um, it tells us, essentially, it's supposed to tell us how satisfied the patients are, members are with the plan, in terms of the care they get at their doctor's offices, and how easy the plan makes it for them to access their care and to get that care. So it's kind of a, it's a, kind of a meter to see how well the plan is doing. So in a nutshell, with improved care, uh, there will be improved revenue because CMS has now attached a bonus payment with the star ratings and with increased revenue and we have healthier patients. So that's the goal of having star ratings. Um, again, why star ratings? It's CMS's way to pay for performance, but uh, from the other standpoint is really a great opportunity to really dive in deep into the plan's performance and work and see where are those gaps, what can we fix, how can we do something better and get uh, working on that and improve uh, what we do even better. So um, there has been a bonus attached to this star rating and I'll be going into more detail of that very, very soon. But the catch is that beginning in 2015, only plans that are four star or higher will get a bonus payment. Uh, anyone less than four stars will not get the stands to lose money, actually. And plans that are three stars might even go into corrective action plan and might not be allowed to be a plan anymore. So it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of details involved in that. However, currently, CMS has a um, pilot project going on in which three and 3.5 star plans also stand to get, get some payment. Uh, this is their way to really help plans prepare and build the infrastructure to build and to work towards 2015 when only four star plans will get a bonus. Um, this slide is a little confusing because uh, one thing to remember is that um, the, the bonus payment, um, there's a two year lag between when uh, the performance or the activity and the bonus payment. So I'm gonna try and make this a little simple if I can, but um, 
So uh, if you look at um, this right here, uh, our current rating is 3.5. And that came from the NSA 2010 data, meaning the patients that were seen in 2010. Um, that data was collected in 2011, and that informed our star rating for 2012. And the money for that is coming out now in 2013. So that informs um, uh, the money that's being paid out next year. So we are here right now. So the patients we've seen in this year, and that information will be reported next year, and that will inform our 2014 star rating, and that will be our 2015 bonus payment. Yeah. So basically, what we do now in 2012 will affect and impact our 2015 quality bonus payment. So if you're not a four star here, we don't get a bonus payment. Um, there are many ways for um, uh, that, there are many, many data sources for star ratings and, and um, key amongst those are member surveys, some of the administrative measures that CMS collects, and we have CMS contractors that do a lot of work, and then our um, Medicare Part C, the medical benefit and the, and the pharmacy data that is all collected uh, in different ways and that all adds up to be the star rating. So um, this is more detail on what goes into it. Here, this is one big source um, of um, uh, data towards star ratings. There are a total of 15 measures in star ratings this year, and 15 come from HEDIS. 10 come, comes from the SCAPS survey, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Five of them come from the Health Outcomes Survey. Five measures come from uh, pharmacy patient safety-like uh, measures. Um, some from grievances, appeals, complaints, and some of them are other measures that are administrative in nature. So, um, so what is HEDIS? I've talked about HEDIS a lot, and that is a part of star ratings, and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about HEDIS and why it's important. So HEDIS stands for Healthcare Effectiveness Data Information Set, and it is the most widely used performance uh, measurement set across the industry. It's actually, it's supposed to help consumers really compare plans before they sign on um, every year. Um, this data set is collected either via claims information or through chart review that happens every year in spring. Um, HEDIS data comprises of claims data and survey, member survey information. So then why do we really collect HEDIS and what's the use? One, it's required contractually uh, for all MA plans to collect and report HEDIS data every year. And CMS uses this information to oversee the performance of MA plans. Um, and health plans use this information to really evaluate how they're performing and set quality improvement goals based on the data they get from um, what they, what's reported. And finally, of course, HEDIS results inform star rating, and um, star rating uh, then gets you the quality bonus. So that's why it's also more important. Um, now, how is HEDIS collected? As mentioned before, a lot of the, a lot of the data comes from our claims information. However, not all this information can come from claims. For example, there's one measure uh, for, the, for blood pressure control. What we are required to report is the blood pressure reading. That actually means we have to go to the doctor's office and look into medical records and get that information and submit that. And so uh, that cannot come on a claim, uh, the blood pressure reading. So there are a few measures that we have to go out and look at all chart, charts and get that information. Uh, so every year, and I'm sure several uh, of you have had visits from HEDIS reviewers this year, um, we have our reviewers who are trained, uh, visit our offices, and collect information that we need to report. Uh, again, this is a sample, uh, it's just a random sample that's pulled by CMS, and we have to go and visit those offices and, and uh, collect information. We collect information for BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol management, colorectal cancer screening, and um, some diabetes measures. So uh, star rating measures, uh, there are 50 of them, and uh, for Part C and Part D. Part D is pharmacy and Part C is medical. Um, and while there are four domains across, across these, we're gonna be focusing on staying healthy and managing chronic conditions. Um, star rating 50 measures, each of these measures have a weight attached to them, and, um, and these are then, it's there's, computed simply on a weight and, and an average, and that's how then Part C and Part D uh, together gives us our star rating. There's a two-year lag between the performance and the payment here, 
and these measures can change every year. New measures can be added or old measures retired, and we wouldn't really know until it happens. We don't really get enough, enough any heads up on what's changing. Uh, so we cannot always plan for what's coming or what's in store. So what does all this boil down to? Um, in, your, in your packet, right behind your slides, there should be a slide like this, which is accurate. What you have in your slide set may not be correct. So what this really boils down to is that um, okay, this is how it affects us financially. It's a little complicated size, so I'm trying to make it a little easy if possible. So before, the QBP is a quality bonus payment. Previously, there was no uh, money attached to getting a star rating. Plans have a 3.5, 4, or 5. I uh, did not get any extra bone, any money for being a higher rated plan. So based on, based on this $800 per member per month, uh, regardless of, the, of your star rating, there's the same reimbursement. Presently, um, 3.5 star plan, which is what we are, you would get 3.5% per member per month. However, come 2015, if a plan is four, if it's not four, it's less than four star, they would not get any extra additional money. But a four star plan would get 4%. And uh, assuming membership is 16,000 throughout, it's, what it translates into is about $6 million annually in quality bonus payment uh, if you were to be a four star plan. So it's, it has a huge financial um, impact if you were to be a four-star plan in 2015. And that really is the work we do in 2012. And I'm hoping that the tools that I have uh, for you, and I'll, I'll walk you through those, uh, will really help make it easy. So how can you help get to a four-star plan? I've listed several things over here. Uh, and I'll go over, and I have a tool that will hopefully help um, us get there. Uh, but things like managing chronic diseases, enhancing clinical documentation, um, discussing physical and mental health with, with patients, and you know some very basic things which we all do, but uh, so that we can, can capture information and report uh, really help us. So moving on, um, I have a report here shared, and I so that looks like this. And I hope to walk you all through this report. It's a sample report that um, I'd like to introduce to everybody today. And our plan is to really share this report with real data in early summer. So this report really lists um, all the HEDIS measures, most of the HEDIS measures that are important. And um, on, on, page, on, on the second page after the cover, what we have is a list of measures that are collected using chart review. And if you look at the first line there, um, say the BMI assessment. We have the number of patients in the physician's panel uh, who are eligible to be included for this reporting. So the three members in the sample report that are eligible, of which just one has had um, this, this service. And um, it gives also national average of where, what the national average for BMI is and what is SoundPath Health's uh, rate for that measure. Moving on to page um, uh, after that, two pages after that, we will share with you the three members who were eligible for that measure and those who are not compliant, meaning who haven't got that test done or who haven't got that uh, screening done, and that should help hopefully inform who you could call into your office to uh, close that gap in care. Uh, and that's for all the measures that we need to report and help improve the star ratings and beyond. So um, also just a point to note that HEDIS measures, even if there are so, if your panel doesn't have any patients who are eligible for that measure, this report will still include information on the measure. Um, one point to note is that there may be members or patients of yours in the report who may have had that test, but it still shows up here, and that is because there's a, there's a lag in the claims being processed. 
So when that, uh, the refresh data, this is the data that's processed again, we should hopefully see those members uh, not show up at the end if they are compliant. I also have another um, one page tool that is on your left in your chair, and it's basically a star rating improvement tips uh, list. And this, truly, this is really linked to the previous report that I shared with you. And um, it summarizes key things that, um, that you could do to help improve the star rating. And uh, three main things are highlighted in bold up there, documenting uh, the BMI and the weight in the medical record, um, blood pressure control to be less than 140 over 90, improving documentation and managing clinical uh, chronic conditions, completing annual wellness exams for all patients, and discussing physical and mental health. Because uh, in the health outcome survey that I mentioned to you, the questions that are asked to patients are things like, did your physician discuss um, physical exercise with you? And it's something that the patient has to say yes or no, and, and we get a rating based on that. On the CAPS survey, which is the patient satisfaction survey, the questions are, um, there are a variety of questions, about 80-odd 80, 80 questions. Some questions pertain to uh, doctor communication, uh, the access to care, or did they get the care they needed on time? Then health plan customer service, how, how, how soon we answer their questions, or any complaints. And it's a variety of things that they're asked to see how satisfied they are with the plan. Um, so that's why I listed all these things here. The bottom of the of this sheet is information where you could reach me or Dr. Young for any questions you may have on this. Um, and before I end my presentation, I want to leave you with this. And we have to take any questions you may have. Yes. What's the, the backslider downgrade of the star rating? Let's well, give it again. The backslider downgrade. Suppose, for instance, that a group health has a five star mm -hmm. rating, and the next year their EDERS performance is uh -huh. 3.5. How long is that going to take to equate to the change? Or is it forever? No, if their uh, rating goes down, so would they, they would, in fact, if they go into 3.5, they would not get a bonus payment based on the, on the, on the new, new role. The, so if it's just for that year. Yeah, for the length, year yeah. length to that performance year. And then the next year, if their performance went up and they got back to a four or above, then in the next year they'd be eligible again. So right, it would change every year. And, and, and there's what, a three year lag? Two year lag. Two year lag. Between performance and um, payment. Start of the year that is two years after the end of the right. performance. Right. So patients seen in 2012, we'll, the bonus we'll get a rating in 2014. Um, well, 2014. Yeah, and then the payment will happen in 2015. Oh, and then 2015 is the payment. In terms of the change in the threshold. From yes. Okay. Thank you. It's not as usual. <laughs> not as usual. So. Uh, hey, hey, bro. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. Hey, or is this the AAA hey, 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 survival group, huh? I don't think you can remember what meeting this is oh, tonight, yeah, Dr. John. Hey, have oh, some more. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, 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 uh, excuse me. I forgot to do this before dinner. Ah! That's great. Thank technique. you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, what do we got here? Well, we're, we're interested in hearing oh, your, uh, hearing your, uh, if you can remember any of this information tonight. I don't know. There's this battle here. Everybody got the uh, results? <clears throat> So, of the speaker, what are the HCC diagnoses as I entered here? HCC, RAF scoring. You asked about the current speaker or the previous speaker? Uh, the previous speaker was very polite, very gentle, and very healthy. I'm talking about the current speaker. Oh, okay. Oops. Well, let's see. So, I'll give you the answer. What's it worth? Look at the data. The current speaker has diabetes. That's worth almost $5,000 based on the creatinine level that you saw before. I have chronic kidney disease stage three. That's worth another $3,500. <clears throat> based on my liver fun I my entry with the bottle, I probably have alcohol dependence because it's inappropriate for somebody speaker to come up bringing a wine bottle. <clears throat> my liver function studies were abnormal, and I had to use an inhaler five times to get up here to speak. <clears throat> if <clears throat> my provider diagnosed all of these, documented it in the chart, and came up with a treatment plan, that's worth almost $19,000 
increase capitation over the base level over the next year. <clears throat> so HCC coding is about good patient care and it's about increased financial reimbursement. <clears throat> How many people know what HCC is? <clears throat> Not too many. How many people know what a RAF score is? <clears throat> a few more. <clears throat> So the HCC system is what CMS developed to decide in a Medicare Advantage plan who is healthy and who is less healthy. <clears throat> I won't even try to say what it stands for, a hierarchical um, coding. <clears throat> if we have sicker patients, PSW gets a higher capitation. If we get a higher capitation, they can reimburse us more. <clears throat> or. Excuse me? Or better able. <clears throat> or better able to cover the cost. <clears throat> Recognizing who your patients are and knowing what chronic diseases they are helps in medical management. <clears throat> if you know somebody has chronic kidney disease, you're a little bit more about following their creatinine. If you have COPD, you want to look at their medicines, uh, follow their peak flows. I find that using the HCC model and documenting these diagnoses helps my RAF score, but it very much helps my patient management. <clears throat> Patients with greater disease burden are sicker, they are harder to take care of, they take more time, and providers should be paid more for taking care of those sicker speakers. <clears throat> so here's how it works. You come up with a diagnosis code <clears throat> or a diagnosis in words. That's the ICD-9. You have to pick a diagnosis that is in the HCC model. That's the difficult part. We all have to learn that model and or at least learn 45 codes in that model so we know where to spend our time doing documentation and treatment. <clears throat> so PSW has a cheat sheet kindly help by yourself. PSW has five cheat sheets <clears throat> and I'm happy to go to anybody's practice and sit down and work with them. <clears throat> with the diagnosis you get an HCC code <clears throat> and with that somebody <laughs> determines your RAF score which is a relative value. <clears throat> Here's some examples. The PSW RAF score for last year was 0.87. An average Medicare Advantage patient in Thurston and Lewis County has a RAF score of 1.0. <clears throat> you get paid significantly more based on the RAF score. Look at the numbers. PSW got a capitation of 748. If everybody had a RAF score of 1 in Thurston County, that goes up to 841. Of course, everybody knows that Lewis County patients are easier to take care of and Medicare has decided that it's less expensive, so their RAF score is 740. <clears throat> After several years of working with Dr. Fairbrook, I have worked with the model, and I've gotten my RAF score up to 1.48. Some of my patients are in Lewis, some are in Thurston. Wow, <clears throat> my capitation to PSW is almost $1,200. Now, I'm not saying my patients are sicker than your guys'. I'm just saying that I probably spent a little more time getting the right diagnosis down and documenting that. <clears throat> adequate documentation, adequate use of the RAF score allows PSW to get more funds, allows us to make money, and that then will hopefully come back to us. <clears throat> Most P PCPs are capitated. The PSW capitation is HCC risk adjusted. <clears throat> So if your RAF score is 5% above PSW average, I think that was 0.84, you will get an enhanced capitation. If your RAF score is higher, the higher your RAF score, the higher your enhanced capitation. <clears throat> you can earn up to $20 more per patient per month. The baseline capitation is about 47. $20 on top of that <clears throat> gets you to 67. That's a significant amount of money capitation. <clears throat> Oops. Last year, 22 offices got enhanced capitation, and look at that bottom line, $205,000 enhanced capitation went out to those providers because of their HCC coding, their good documentation of patient care, and their RAF score. <clears throat> Here's some examples of what some of the diagnoses are worth. Look at diabetes, just plain diabetes, <clears throat> 250.0, no mention of complications, worth $1,500. <clears throat> if you go up to diabetes with neuropathy by documenting their loss of sensation, boy, you're up to almost $4,000 more capitation per year. 
you have renal disease, you're up to $5,000. <clears> if you have anybody with chronic kidney disease, proteinuria, creatinine clearance under 60, that all of a sudden gets you up to 3,500. <clears throat> Peripheral vascular disease is there. <clears throat> I love it. Congestive heart failure. You read those echocardiograms, you diagnose that, you come up with a treatment plan. We all do this. <clears throat> you know, you think about, does this person need to be on an ACE inhibitor? Does this person need to be on a diuretic for their diastolic heart failure? Boy, that's worth $4,000. A new one I learned in this is protein calorie malnutrition. If their albumin is below a certain number, <clears throat> can't read this that far away. Oh, the notes aren't there. <clears throat> I think it's 2.4. They've had weight loss. They have a chronic disease. You document that. You can diagnose protein calorie malnutrition. That gets you $8,000 more coming into the health plan. Of course, metastasis and cancer is worth a great deal more. And so if one of your patients comes back, they have bony metastasis, you are managing their pain, you are managing their disease, code for that, go for it. <clears throat> if the HCC diagnoses are not documented in the record, we don't give a history, we don't provide some physical exam, talk about it in the analysis and come up with a treatment plan, they can't be given credit for, the health plan can't get money for it, your RAF score will not go up. It comes about adequate documentation and knowing the system on what to do. <clears throat> Yes. And there are certain documentary requirements. It's not enough to document, for we're, instance, that they have renal disease and that they have diabetes. You have to document that the renal disease is a consequence. Of Hold on. If you're taking my talk away, you better hear. You got to come up here, huh? Right. <laughs> Once you know I'm paying attention. Hey, I love that. I love it. I'm glad nobody's there sleeping quite yet. You know, and now the, the hard part of this talk is about the word police and the government. And this thing called a Rad V audit, where they come out and look at uh, something like 200 charts or 400 charts in the health plan, and they want to very much not pay us the money for those RAF scores and our capitation. <clears throat> and they look at certain requirements of every progress note. I realize this is charting 101. Every progress note has to have a patient name, date of birth. It has to have a data service. It has to have a provider signature with letters after the name, whether you're an MD, PA, ARNP. <clears throat> if you're using an electronic medical record, that letter, that note has to be locked to get your signature on it and make it a signed note. <clears throat> I found out as I was preparing this talk that if I print out a three-page record for my ECW EMR, the patient name did not show up on the second page. We submitted that to uh, CMS. That progress note would be completely thrown out for that simple little reason that the patient name wasn't on the third note. <clears throat> I've now changed my format so the patient name shows up on each printed page. <clears throat> you know, if you do a fantastic job, you document seven HCC diagnoses, diabetes, renal disease, heart failure, COPD, malignant metastatic cancer, you do a perfectly history, you come up with a great treatment plan, you have a wonderful diagnosis to uh, support it and you treat each one of those, and you forget to sign it, you get nothing. That signature becomes very important. <clears throat> Last year, Medicare recouped $6 billion just because physicians and providers did not sign their note. <clears throat> as soon as they don't see a signature, the review of that chart stops, it's failed, any money that was paid for those HCC diagnoses, the health plan, uh, the health plan has to give back to Medicare. That's a big dollar amount. <clears throat> okay, if you have a signature sheet in your office where everybody has their name and their initial or whatever they scribble to be their signature and beside it is their full signature and that's up to date, <clears throat> I believe that will be that will meet the requirement. I used to sign all my notes LJ. But we had a signature sheet, and when the reviewer came, I said, that LJ stands for this signature, which is my whole signature with MD at it, and so I made it. <clears throat> but if you don't scribble your initials there, you're dead. Does I was, everyone have such a sheet? Anyone here who doesn't have that kind of documentation in their office? Because I really would be happy to help you. That's a simple
you know, when the reviewers are there and they're looking for those signatures, they should be given a copy of that sheet. When an MA does something, she gives a medicine or she talks to them about this treatment or that treatment, she needs to put her initials down there that that was done. That's not on the criteria, but I bet they'll catch it. The reviewers who go out and do these Rad B audits get paid by how much money they recoup. They get no salary, it's pay for performance. <clears throat> and that performance comes off of our back. <clears throat> you know, documentation. You need to mention that they have the problem, you need to give a little history, you need to document what's going on with their diabetes, you need to come up with an analysis that says what they have, and you have to document a treatment plan to get credit for that diagnosis. <clears throat> If the analysis doesn't match the history and the history doesn't match the analysis, the note doesn't stand. So I'm talking to somebody, he's sitting there coughing, I write down COPD in the analysis because I know he has it, but I didn't mention it in the history and physical, I didn't talk about how many inhalers he's using or his increased AP diameter. The COPD down there, which meets the HCC model, won't be counted because it's not documented and if I haven't offered a treatment, even if I did document the history, it won't fly. <clears throat> the but word police are out there. But if all that was documented the visit previously. <clears throat> if you diagnosed COPD at the previous visit and it had a good history and physical and a treatment plan and you presented that visit to the reviewer to support your HCC diagnosis, it would work. If you forgot to diagnose it, but you put it on the next visit, but you didn't bring all the documentation forward, the note that has the diagnosis has to stand on its own. <clears throat> that is utterly ridiculous. I didn't say it wasn't ridiculous. Historically, Medicare has said if it's in the chart once, but we're not having redundant notes. That's not true with RADB audits. Okay, I, I got to keep going. I'm on a very high, tight time frame. The other thing is the coders cannot make any assumptions. This once again comes down to the word police. <clears throat> we know if we put something down there, you know, diabetes hyphen chronic kidney disease, we're talking that that chronic kidney disease is related to diabetes, but that's an assumption. <clears throat> Here's an example. <clears throat> down there at the fourth line on the bottom may not be linked with punctuation. If you document diabetes with chronic kidney disease or CHF due to hypertension, diabetic retinopathy, those are all acceptable. But if you get a little sloppy and you put diabetes hyphen chronic kidney disease <clears throat> and the coder comes up, she cannot conclude that that chronic kidney disease and diabetes are related. <clears throat> you know, I just love the government and the word police. No more comments. <clears throat> The word history. How many times have we presented a case this has a history of CHF, hypertension, kidney disease, diabetes, <clears throat> and he's here presenting with a chronic cough. The word history in CMS language means a problem that the patient used to have that is inactive, it goes in past medical history, and it cannot contribute to the current management and the current HCC diagnosis or contribute to your RAF score. <clears throat> That's the way they look at it. This, all this new stuff came up in my talk, and so you have to say patient has hypertension, COPD, diabetes, not history of. History of is one of those key words that will drop the whole chart out, and even though you've done a great job, the reviewer will love to throw it out. I hope we never get reviewed. <clears throat> the hard part about HCC, and I have to thank Dr. Fairbrook for this, is you have to learn what diseases hit the model. <clears throat> and it's just a matter of sitting down with our handouts. I came up with a one that was kind of a uh, takeoff from uh, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Fairbrook's very first one he gave me Agave years ago to try to make it very simple. When I look at a new patient or I come in for an annual visit, I think of which one of these codes does this patient have and how can I code it so I hit the HCC model. <clears throat> Let's try to make it simple. <clears throat> Here's a minimally acceptable but an acceptable note. You can't see it. 
it says something like diabetes and blood sugar 150 denies polyuria polydipsia blurry vision has some tingling of the extremities COPD uh, shortness of breath on stairs using rescue inhaler denies orthopnea we didn't write down the medicine list in the physical exam it's there um, diagnosis diabetes controlled with humalog COPD stable with atrovent okay to refill <clears throat> I gave a history the physical exam was there in the summary the analysis I gave the diagnosis and I gave a treatment plan that's an acceptable note that would allow you to get HCC diagnosis here's a note that our coder found <clears throat> two notes for the history and physical ankle pain next team helping blood pressure four diagnoses that hit the HCC model with no discussion no documentation and no treatment plan <clears throat> it was signed you will not get any credit for that very brief note <clears throat> you know where I started my HCC coding was in diabetes it hits the model the complications hit the model so let's see what we can do with this <clears throat> the first step with diabetes you gotta decide if they're type 1 or type 2 you gotta decide if they're controlled or not controlled we all know how to do that <clears throat> when you get down to the analysis you have to state that diabetes type 2 controlled or uncontrolled so the coder can come in and give you the right numbers the very next step in that diabetic patient <clears throat> is to come up with any complications we all know the complications renal disease ophthalmic disease neuropathy peripheral vascular disease ulcers of the feet each one of those additional diagnoses will hit the model if you document code and come up with a treatment plan <clears throat> so I've got some pretty short notes here uh, they're probably not the best but here's a note about diabetes presenting complaint diabetes 2 a little bit about the history um, I got to come up with whether it's controlled or uncontrolled I have an assessment diabetes uncontrolled I have a treatment plan that takes care of that diabetes thing <clears throat> the very next note <clears throat> oh there's a note coming out of my EMR where I have tried to document all of that thing off my template now we got to go on to the very next thing what's the complication <clears throat> this particular patient has some renal disease creatinine clearance either has the, the urinalysis either has proteinuria with a positive microalbumin creatinine on two separate occasions three months apart or their creatinine clearance is below 60 to <clears throat> on two separate occasions or it's below 90 on two separate occasions with proteinuria <clears throat> the definitions of chronic kidney disease which has been renamed to chronic kidney illness or something CKI um, you know I love the word police <clears throat> so if I talk about chronic kidney disease what's their creatinine and what is my treatment plan then I can come up with that diagnosis <clears throat> you know what, what's our treatment for chronic kidney disease adequate hydration maybe an ACE inhibitor good blood pressure control you guys know all this stuff it's just a matter of knowing which hits the model <clears throat> so here's here's the analysis section of this patient that has uncontrolled diabetes with chronic kidney disease because each one of those numbers hits the model even though it's redundant my analysis has to put that down so we got diabetes uncontrolled <clears throat> we have chronic kidney disease stage two uh, stage three <clears throat> we have diabetes with neuropathy I realize that you said diabetes twice but diabetes with neuropathy is a different code than diabetes with chronic kidney disease and we put down diabetic or peripheral neuropathy <clears throat> I realize doubling it but that adds to your RAF score it's how the system works <clears throat> we must document the HCC diagnosis discuss the history the treatment at least once a year <clears throat> I saw a patient here a couple months ago one of these very healthy guys on uh, <clears throat> sound path health he came in 12 and a half months after his last visit I missed documenting his five HCC diagnosis within a year so his RAF score is going to drop back down it'll come back up as soon as I put that in but the payment will be delayed it's like a year or two years I forget it's a long way out <clears throat> they must be documented every year <clears throat> I have found with my EMR I'm in just my second year that to think about redocumenting each one of these conditions is very difficult <clears throat> so I've developed fixed templates 
I have my diabetic template, and I have my non-diabetic HCC template, which might be COPD, uh, depression, uh, alcohol dependence, drug dependence, um, seizures, Parkinsonism, and I just generate a template that talks about their history, when it started, what their symptoms are. There's a physical exam there. There's all the analysis, and I actually put the treatment plan up in the history, just because it's all there. And the coders say they don't care where the treatment plan is, as long as it's in the progress note. So once every nine months, I can take this template, drop it into their visit that I've asked them to come in and see it, and update it, read through the note, make sure it's still accurate. You know, you got to check the lab work and see what any management, and go from there. Just a second. It tells me I need another drink. <laughs> there are many ways to do this. That's how I found one usefulness of my EMR. <clears throat> What's, what is, what's our insurance company going to do? What they have been doing is sending the coders out to your office and retrospectively looking at your charts and trying to generate codes that meet the HCC diagnosis. <clears throat> We've been doing that. It's been happening twice a year. If they see something that needs to change, they give you a little bit of advice. One plan they've come up with, maybe in the future, is to give you a checklist, have somebody come out and review the chart, pay you for a special annual visit, where you go through all the HCC diagnosis, have a checklist, you can check off and get all the documentation you need, a copy of that goes to the insurance company, a copy of that goes to your chart, so you have your annual HCC visit, obviously you didn't call it that, you called it um, annual illness review, <clears throat> or you call it diabetes, hypertension, uh, aortic aneurysm, COPD, <laughs> whatever you want to say. <clears throat> we don't know the right way, uh, some health systems have gone out and sent a nurse practitioner out to the patient's home to try to document all this. I don't think that's going to work because you need all that vast amount of information you have in your chart. <clears throat> so, what it comes down to, if you think about good patient care, you figure out what diagnoses they have, what you have to treat, what you have to watch. You do that uh, ultrasound on that 55-year-old guy with a 50-pack year history of smoking and hypertension, and you find out he's got a little aortic aneurysm. You put that on your problem list, and you come back next year, and you maybe want to do another ultrasound be to see if it's getting bigger or smaller, or he needs a beta blocker. This leads to good quality care. The diabetics, you know, if they got renal disease, you got to know about that. You got to think about checking their creatinine. Do they need an ACE inhibitor or an ARB? You guys know all that. <clears throat> if they have neuropathy, they can't feel that 10 gram monofilament sensation. What does that mean? What's the what is the significance of not feeling 10 gram monofilament sensation? Increased risk of amputation. <clears throat> That's the prediction. That's where that test came from. Yes, they can get foot ulcers and all kinds of other infections. So that means you have to be a little bit more aware. Maybe look at their feet more often. Anyway, if you do this, you learn the coding system, you put the diagnosis down, let the coders put the numbers in the chart. So I tried to leave all the numbers out of this talk. Those of us who are doing it can rattle off all these five-digit numbers. The coders can do that if you put the words in there, come up with a treatment plan. Bingo, your RAF score can go up. The RAF average for PSW patients goes up. Everybody's happy. Patients get better care, we get better reimbursement. If there's good documentation in the RAF, uh, that audit comes around, you'll pass. I can stop here, I can go through some of the diagnoses that are on your handout, but oh my gosh, I'm seven minutes over time, so you guys have been a wonderful audience. <laughs>